Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar today. My name is Lucy Moore and I'm a Professional Education Manager at ACCA. So our session today is designed to support you in your preparation for a strategic professional computer-based exam. And I'm really pleased to be joined by a fellow ACCA colleague, James Patrick. James is Head of Professional Education Solutions at ACCA and he's responsible for the support that we offer to both students and tutors. And my focus is specifically on student support, such as the webinar that we're running for you. So let's start to have a look at the agenda then. I'm going to be just starting um, by giving you a quick introduction, really, um, a reminder of why, um, as ACCA, we've introduced strategic professional CBEs. And we're then going to take a tour, basically, of our exam support for strategic professional CBE, looking at all of the different resources available um, to help you prepare, help you succeed, but really focusing in on our key piece of support for strategic professional CBE, which is the practice platform. And um, we're also going to be giving you guidance um, on recommended approaches and techniques for using the CBE functionality effectively, managing your workspace effectively, um, all of which will help prepare you for exam success. If you're, if you're confident in how you're using the, the CBE environment and you've practiced it well, then you'll be much, much better set up to succeed in the exams. And um, we're also going to be touching on some really important examiner feedback in this, this whole area of using the, the workspace effectively and so on, some tips and techniques directly from the examining teams about, um, about how to, you know, how to get the most out of it, things to avoid, that sort of thing. So James will be touching on that a bit later. And then we're going to be finishing off with a Q&A session. Um, we're going to take it in turns to, to monitor the questions that are coming in. Um, throughout the session, we'll be responding to as many of them as we can, but we will hopefully have some time at the end to share um, some of the really good questions that we've had through live in a live Q&A, um, sharing the questions that we think will benefit people the most. Um, but apologies if we can't, we can't guarantee necessarily replying to everything directly, either via web chat or um, verbally at the end, but we will do our very best to get through as many questions as we can. OK, so let's kick off. And like I said, I just want to give you a, a really brief introduction, really, to, to um, strategic professional CBEs. Well, we started this process of um, replacing paper-based exams with computer-based exams in March 2020. And we're actually nearing the end of that process now. So I hope that the concept of strategic professional CBE is familiar to, to most of you listening. And why did we do that? Well. The world doesn't stand still and neither does ACCA and throughout our long history we've always worked really hard to innovate um, from basing the qualification on IFRS through to introducing tax and law variants and we're always looking for ways to adapt and enhance our offering to meet the changing needs of the accountancy profession and you know, that's that's what drove us really to, to move our strategic professional exams to computer based exams. So like our applied skills CBEs, they incorporate the main tools that finance professionals use on a daily basis, including spreadsheets, word processors. Um, so by doing your exams in this way, you are really, really ensuring that you are workplace ready if you're not already out there working. OK, so that's just um, an introduction to kind of set the scene and get us started. And now we move on to the really, really important stuff. So what do we have available to help prepare you if you are um, looking to take a strategic professional CBE? OK, well, we have this really nice one page document. This is available in the resources section that I mentioned at the beginning. So if you have a look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a file symbol. If you click on that, it should bring up a box. Um, that has a list of resources in it. I think this one's probably first in the list. Um, it's a document that's designed to bring together all of the key resources we have for strategic professional CBE in one place. So you just need to refer to this. It's interactive. You can um, click on the links in the document. It has exam specific links. It has information about what each resource is. Um, and it tries to kind of talk you through them in a sensible, logical order. So, you know, we, we mentioned here what we would recommend doing um, first when you're preparing for an SPCBE, so the types of resources that you should be looking at 
um, initially, then moving on, um, and I'm going to talk through each of those those resources now. Okay, that's going to structure our session. Right, so we first off have introductory resources, and you should be able to hopefully see on this screenshot, um, those introductory resources include things like a video to help you understand what strategic professional CBEs are like, as well as additional resources to enable you to become more familiar with the CBE environment. And like I said, the document includes exam specific links. So um, assuming that you're preparing for a, a particular exam, then do download this one page of document and then you can click on the exam that you're interested in and get those introductory resources for that exam. Another kind of introductory resource, I would say, so this um, is a CBE guidance document. We actually have more than one. We have a version for um, strategic business leader, which is separate because we use some slightly different terminology in that exam. So we have this strategic business leader version and then another version of the guidance document, which covers the other exams of the ACCA, sorry, of the strategic professional um, level of the qualification. And this is a great resource. It's like a reference resource to use when you first start engaging with the CBA environment, you start using the practice platform, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, and this document gives you additional information information about the functionality found in the exam environment, gives you a bit more detail. So if you start doing some practice questions on the practice platform and you're not sure how to use a particular piece of functionality, have this document to hand and you should be able to look it up and find out a bit more about how that works. OK, so this is, like I said, our key resource for strategic professional CBE, actually applied skills as well. The practice platform has content for applied skills in it. And this resource allows you to practice exam standard questions um, using software that replicates the real exam environment in both um, terms of look and feel, so, you know, how it looks and everything, it looks exactly like the real exam, but also, really importantly, the functionality. It includes some fantastic tools to help you mark your own work as you complete practice questions, which is a behaviour that we know contributes to exam success, so we're really trying to encourage students to do this wherever possible. Um, in a moment, I'm going to uh, actually play a pre-recorded video, which will give you a quick tour of the platform and an introduction to what it can offer. Um, before we look at that video, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. So related to the practice platform, in our resources section of the webinar, there is a video which explains how you can access it. So if it's not something you've used before and you're a bit confused about where to find it, then please have a look at that video on practice platform access because that will explain um, where you find it, how you can get get access to it. We also have a marking support video in the resources section. Now, I said I mentioned briefly, and you'll see in more detail in this video coming up, that the practice platform has this really neat functionality which allows you to mark your own work. Um, and if you want a bit of support in how you might kind of approach that, then we have a marking support video which is available to download from the resources section of this webinar. That's a generic video. We do have um, exam specific marking support videos available now for most of our exams and you can find those in the relevant section of the resource finder. Okay, before we move on to look at the video I mentioned, I just wanted to pause for a moment to share some quite recent statistics with you around the impact that using the practice platform has on student performance. So you can see there um, on the left hand side, we have a chart for applied skills and strategic professional on the right hand side. And you can see that across the board, students perform better when they use the practice platform. OK, and this these stats are taken from March this year. This has been a consistent trend since we launched the practice platform. And we started monitoring it. So since last September, at least, um, we've seen this same trend of students who use the practice platform as part of their exam preparation, consistently performing better than students who don't use it. So I just wanted to really emphasize that if anybody, you know, if you haven't used the practice platform yet, if you've been kind of wavering about it, if you're a bit nervous about, you know, getting started with it and using it, try to take this as the, the motivation to, um, to get you using it, because I think that that tells a really powerful story. 
Okay, in a second, I'm gonna press play on this video. Like I said, that will give you a quick tour and introduction to the practice platform. Um, and then James is going to come in and pick up on some of the points in that video um, and just give you a little bit more information, some top tips around using the practice platform. So I'm going to give you a short demo of the practice platform, predominantly from the perspective of the student experience, but some of what I show you will also give you an idea of how tutors can interact with it. This is the dashboard. On the top left of the screen, you'll see we have various tabs. Uh, we're on the home tab at the minute, and we'll look around this a bit more in a moment. Um, next to that, we have the mark tab, which is where students can mark answers they've completed. The results tab is where they can see those marked responses and the performance tab is where they can review their progress across the various tests they've done. I also want to show you the help functionality which is accessed via this question mark icon and it contains lots of really detailed user guidance as you can see including FAQs to support users when they're getting started with the platform. So on the left hand side of the homepage here, we have the assigned material section. ACCA approved learning partners can request their own instance of the platform, which would be branded with their corporate colours and logo. And they can then assign content to their students via this instance. And this area is where students would access that content. If I scroll down, you'll see there's also a self-assigned material section, and this is where students can access material they've assigned to themselves from the content that's been made available by ACCA. And that content comes from the catalogue on the right-hand side, which covers the core applied skills and strategic professional exams. We have a specimen for each exam, as well as other practice tests, which are based on past exam content. And these will always be kept up to date for any syllabus changes. So let's have a look at how we access content in the catalogue. I'm going to select Advanced Performance Management, click on ACCA Official Resources, and then the specimen. Before I assign that to myself, I just want to mention the blank workspace you can see listed here. There's one of these listed under every exam in the catalogue. Um, they don't contain any question content, but they give students the opportunity to complete printed practice questions they may have access to in the CBE environment, which is a really nice example of the platform's flexibility. So let's assign this APM specimen. If I scroll back to self-assigned material, you can see it's appeared there. Now, I'm going to open this test shortly so that I can create a pretend answer to a question to allow us to look at the marking functionality. But before I do that, I just wanted to show you a really key piece of functionality in the practice platform, which allows students to download exams to complete offline later on. And this has real benefits for our students in markets where the internet maybe isn't reliable or where it's common not to have your own permanent internet connection or where data costs are prohibitively high. So if I click on those three dots, just move that button across to the right, you'll see a notification has come up confirming that that um, exam has been saved for offline use. And what that means is if I were to go offline, um, reopen my browser, go back to the URL at the top, this APM specimen would load for me. I could then complete it offline. It would be saving locally to my machine. And then when I'm back online, the answers I've completed would upload to the system to be available for marking. So let's open this APM specimen. Now, as you know, the practice platform completely replicates the look and feel of the real exams. And that includes these instruction screens I'm just clicking through. So we're really giving students the real exam experience. And here we are on the first question of the APM specimen. This is a typical layout for our strategic professional content, and it's exactly how it would look in the real exam. The question requirements are available here, and below that, the response options. If I open the word processor, you see I can move the window around and resize it, and I can do the same with an exhibit. Um, I can also copy the information in the exhibit. So I select it, I'm doing control C to copy and then control V to paste it into the word processor. And all of this functionality that I'm showing you is exactly the same as in the, the real exam. I am just going to very quickly reformat that answer a bit, which doesn't take very long. And there we have a pretend answer that we can go on to mark in a moment. Um, I would just like to show you this nice tool here, which is a print button. 
and this allows students to either print or um, save as PDF an answer that they can then send to a tutor to get feedback. Um, before we submit the answer, just to say there is a lot of functionality on this screen. It's quite, you know, it's quite detailed. Um, and we have a really nice package of wraparound support for our students for the strategic professional CBEs. For example, each exam has a series of videos which talk students through a really methodical approach to tackling them. And the practice platform then gives them that environment in which they can practice those techniques we've shown them before the real thing. So if we pretend that we've completed this exam, I'll just navigate through to the final question and end the exam. We come back to the home page and then we can go to the mark tab and you'll see the APM specimen appears there. So this is the marking screen. Um, this marking area is the same for both students and tutors. At first glance, it does look a bit involved, maybe a bit technical, but it's intuitive to use. And we're really encouraging students to take advantage of this marking functionality. It is not just for tutors. There's lots that students can gain from it as well. On the left hand side, we have the marking guidelines and the sample answer can also show here as well. Um, I can zoom in if I want to scroll up and down zoom out. To flick between the marking guidelines and the sample answer, I go to the right hand side. If I just click there, the sample answer appears and click back on marking guidelines and that brings that back up. In the middle here, we have our question content, just in case we need to refer to it at any point during marking. But I'm actually just going to click on that arrow to minimise it. Here we have the pretend answer that we generated. Um, that's in the word processor tab. If we'd entered anything into the spreadsheet response area, that would show here. Um, to mark an answer effectively, we suggest to students that they uh, work through it, comparing it to the sample answer or the marking guidelines, working out what points would have generated them credit, which areas are perhaps weaker, and making notes about any areas they'd want to revisit. So to illustrate this and how it works, I'm going to turn on tick marking mode, which activates these buttons at the top. I then need to identify the part of the question that I want to mark. So I'm just going to click on that button there. I can now minimize this area of the screen as well. And we now have a really nice clean space for marking. So I select the tick button and then I can start assigning myself marks. So maybe for the first couple of points there, I think I've earned one mark for each of them. Maybe down here, I refer to the marking guidelines and I think, no, actually I've done well there. That's worth a bit more. And I give myself three marks. And if I want to um, maybe make a note for myself about an area that I want to revise in more detail, I can just select it and then add the notes and save it there. So that's how the marking functionality works. When we looked at the dashboard, you remember I showed you there were some tabs for results and performance. Now, this is my test account, so I don't have any true historical performance in here. But if we go back to the slides, we have a screenshot from the results tab to give you an idea of what students see there. Hi, everyone. Um... So just following on from Lucy's video there, we are now looking at the results tab. Um, and this is where you can see the tests that you've marked or that your tutor um, may have marked for you. So in this particular example, we're looking at um, a test. It's an SBL test and it's been attempted a few times. And you can see the progression in marks uh, at the graph in the graph at the bottom of the screen. Um, from this page, if you did want to go back to your marked answer, you can click on the relevant question on the right hand side of the screen. Um, so hopefully you found this overview of the practice platform useful. Hopefully it's inspired you to, to engage with it and to make use of it if you haven't done so already. As Lucy showed, we've seen a really strong positive correlation in terms of improved performance of students who have used the practice platform compared to those who haven't. So I can't recommend highly enough um, that, that you do make use of it, um, whether that is looking at the specimen exams towards the start of your studies, whether it's practicing the exam standard practice tests, mock exams, um, closer to uh, the actual September session. Um, really worth having a look as soon as you get a chance to everyone.
Um, before I hand back to Lucy to talk about some of the other support that's available, I just wanted to spend a minute or two pulling out my favourite areas um, of the platform, just for your consideration. Um, as you probably aware we, we i've already mentioned um there's a lot of content on there so specimen up to three full exams per um strategic professional subject um up to date with the, the latest syllabuses etc um but on top of that we also have blank workspaces for each uh, of the subjects and i do like the flexibility afforded by the blank workspace and um, what it means is that you can take any question from any source for example, a PDF past exam, maybe a question from your revision kit, um, and you can enter your answer to that question in the exam environment, the word processor, spreadsheet, um, et cetera. Um, so obviously it's not quite the same. So I know you won't be able to interact with the question content um, in the same way that you can for the actual tests on the practice platform itself, um, but writing up your answer on screen using the word processor, using the spreadsheet, maybe the slide response uh, area for um, SBL is still absolutely brilliant um, practice. Um, and just as an illustration on this slide, I'm showing the PDF version of an exam. Um, I think it's from March last year on the left-hand side. So it's just from the website, just a PDF document um, on the left-hand side of the screen. I've just lined up my browser on the right-hand screen to try and replicate that live exam um, as closely as possible. So PDF on the left of my screen, um, blank workspace on the right, and I'm just typing up my answer whilst I scroll up and down uh, on the question. Um, one point to note, if you're using the blank workspace, do save your answer as a PDF if it's something you want to look back on in the future. If you close a blank exam, it won't go anywhere. So you do need to, to save it um, as a PDF. Um, that leads me on nicely to my second top tip for the practice platform. Um, in the video that Lucy showed, you've seen how you can mark and review your answers in the system, which is great. Um, printing and saving adds even more flexibility. So you can keep a separate record of your answer. Um, you could you know, review it at a later date, share it with your tutor or even your peers um, to uh, share ideas as well as part of your studying. Um, as I mentioned, particularly important um, when saving um, answers using the blank uh, workspaces. Um, on screen, you can see for a word processor on the left hand side, there is a print icon, um, so fairly obvious. Um, for the spreadsheet, you do need to go into the menu, uh, the drop down menu, and you can see print uh, at the bottom of that drop down menu on screen. And then for the slides, it's again pretty straightforward. Uh, you can see the print icon. Um, just to be clear, guys, this functionality won't be available in the live exam. This is just for the practice platform. So you don't need to worry about saving, certainly don't need to worry about printing um, in the live exam. It's just a feature of the practice platform. Um, final tip, um, we've talked about this um, a couple of times already. Lucy showed you this in the video. Um, just want to reiterate how important and how useful um, this is. I know your tutors will be telling you that reviewing your answers is a crucial part of practicing question. Um, and hopefully this marking uh, functionality makes it a bit more interesting to do so. Lucy was showing you that you can um, have your answer next to the marking guide, uh, next to the model answer. You can tick, make comments, um, really an interactive process uh, to, as I say, to hopefully make it a bit more interesting to mark. Um, one thing I particularly like about this process is that it's similar to how students will actually mark your live exam. So if you're finding your answer really easy to mark and you can see the great points you've made clearly set out, then you're along the right lines. If you're looking back at your answer and thinking, oh, do I deserve a mark there? Or oh, I'm not sure what I meant you know, in terms of the layout of that calculation, then it's perhaps flagging uh, that you need to think about your exam technique and the way that you're structuring your answer. Okay, Lucy, um, back to you for some additional support uh, that's available for the students. Thanks, James. Can I just check first of all, you can hear me okay? I've got you nice and clear. Perfect, okay. Right, so just to, to pause for a second and recap, what we've looked at so far are the introductory resources that we have to support you if you're preparing for a strategic professional CBE. We 
have looked at the practice platform in more detail that, as we said, that's our key resource. And I think we've said a couple of times now about the impact that it does have on, on performance, but um, I don't think there's any harm at all in, in saying that as many times as possible throughout this session. So introductory resources, practice platform so far. Let's have a look now at the other resources that we have available to support your preparation. Um, and you can see them on your screen. Again, these are all on that one pager that I, I shared with you at the beginning, and you can access that in the resources section. Um, and the rest of the resources on that one pager are all designed really to, to support you in approaching the exam successfully. So first on the list, we have our CBE preparation videos. Um, I love these resources. Uh, these are fantastic. Um, there's a set of four videos for each exam. And each of those videos kind of takes a step-by-step -step approach through to um, kind of suggesting tips and techniques for how you tackle the exam. They're really, really methodical. So the first video is all about um, things that you need to think about before the day of the exam. So your kind of initial preparation, strategizing, all of that kind of thing. Um, the second video is all about the first steps that you should take on beginning your exam. So flicking through all the different requirements, getting an understanding of, of what the exam is asking you, um, asking you to do as a whole. And then we have another two videos, one on how to plan your answers effectively and another on how to complete your answers effectively. So like I said, four videos for each exam. To, take, to watch all four videos would take you no longer than about 15 or 20 minutes. So it's not a big time commitment and I would really, really recommend having a look at them. Next in the list, we have our CBE preparation webinars. Now, these were run before the first strategic professional CBE um, exam. So you, in some ways, you could argue that they're quite old now. But I would, uh, nonetheless, they're very, very valuable still. And, and everything that is said in those webinars still holds true. And um, they're available on demand. You can access them using the links on the document. And these webinars include a practical demonstration from an expert tutor showing you how to work through um, a question in that particular exam and how to use the CBE functionality effectively for that particular exam, because there may well be and there are um, you know, nuances across the different exams where one piece of functionality will be used more heavily, for example. So another really useful one to look at. Also in that, um, in that section, there's a link to a general webinar very similar to this one that we've run previously. Um, to, to give you some more kind of general advice. Next down on the list, the March 2020 review videos. And again, these are kind of, um, these are similar in a way to the CBE preparation videos. It's kind of a top and tailing type approach. So the CBE preparation videos are expert tutors showing you how to approach um, the exam. The review videos, again, were produced by expert tutors, but rather than looking ahead, what they were actually doing is reviewing the first um, exam that was sat as a strategic professional CBE, so the March 2020 exams. And the expert tutors worked through those exams, referring to examiner feedback, explaining um, the exam approach to certain questions in, in that exam. Next on the list, we have um, the effective workspace management video. And we're actually going to play that for you um, in a moment. It's just a short video, and it shares some really useful tips and tricks that can make it more efficient for you when attempting questions in the real exam. Um, so pieces of advice, for example, like don't have more windows open at any one time than you need. And the video just suggests some, some sort of techniques um, that you can undertake to, to ensure that you're keeping your screen nice and tidy and so on. So I'll play that in a moment. Um, the last webinar in the list there is our How to Succeed webinars. Again, these are some, some more on-demand webinar links. And these recap the available support for strategic professional CBE, um, share an expert tutor's top tips for approaching each exam, and they also cover guidance on effective workspace management. So that's kind of what we're moving into now. We've done a tour of our resources. Um, we've, we've honed in on the practice platform. And for the rest of this webinar, we're going to talk more about um, strategies for, for using the functionality effectively, managing your workspace effectively, and so on. So 
I'm going to play you the video now that I just mentioned, and then James will pick up um, again after the video has finished and just again, sort of elaborating on some of the points in the video, talking you through some techniques um, that you can use to, to really succeed in these exams. Just as you need an overall strategy for how you approach the exam as a whole, you should also have a strategy for managing the different windows within the exam workspace. This video will provide you with the guidance you need to manage your exam workspace effectively. Our first piece of advice is to only have windows open when you need them. This avoids you having too much open on your screen at one time, allowing you to focus on the task at hand. One way you can minimise the number of windows open in your workspace is by copying the requirements into the appropriate response option. It's worth noting that sometimes the detailed requirements are found in the exhibits. And for some questions, you may need to have two response options open at the same time. Remember, numerical answers should be produced in the spreadsheet so the marker can access your workings. Written answers should go in the word processor. You can reference between the two by labelling each part of your answer clearly. Another way you can minimise the number of open windows is when analysing the exhibits, only having one open at a time where possible. As you go through the exhibits one by one, you can either copy key information into your response option or highlight it, making it easier for you to find later in the exam. This means you don't need to have all of your exhibits open throughout the exam. You can open them as and when you need to. Our second key piece of advice is to have set places on your screen for the different windows. This may be different for each exam. Here you can see that we have the word processor on the right and the requirements on the left. If, as part of your overall exam strategy, you're planning on using the scratch pad, remember to dedicate an area in your workspace for this. This is one example of how you can have your screen set up, but remember you can choose the layout that's best for you. The important thing here is that you have an approach and you apply it consistently. Our third piece of advice for effective workspace management is, where possible, to ensure you're not covering the top and bottom toolbars to make it easier to access these functions. Use the practice platform to plan and test your strategy for managing your workspace effectively. Continue to practice your approach so it comes naturally to you on the day of the exam, giving you the best chance of exam success. Um, as Lucy mentioned um, before the video, let's just spend a little bit of time um, in the session thinking about some high level um, pointers for technique and, and how you approach your um, SPMCBE um, and then wrap up um, with uh, some time for uh, questions. Um, I thought I'd start this segment of the webinar just by feeding back some of the things that the examining teams have been saying um, in the last uh, few uh, CBE sessions. And these headline points are pretty common. So we're seeing these issues appear time and time again. So I'm really keen to flag them um, because hopefully you can take steps to address these issues in advance, obviously, of the September session. Um, and hopefully in, in the September session, we can see these sorts of issues being um, slightly less um, prevalent. Um, so the first one is quite a general point, and it's saying that students aren't necessarily affecting, aren't necessarily using the word processor and the spreadsheet perhaps as effectively as they can. Um, and sometimes students are doing a calculation in the spreadsheet, and then maybe copying and pasting or um, typing up that calculation in the word processor as well. And just as a very very basic point, 
you don't need to be replicating calculations in both responses. Where there is a calculation to be done, so where the requirement or the task requires you to do a calculation, do it in the spreadsheet. Use the functionality of the spreadsheet. You know, that spreadsheet response area will get marked in exactly the same way that the word processor will be. So use the spreadsheet functionality to do your calculations. Don't duplicate it again in the word processor. Then all you need to do is to reference key outcomes or key numbers from that calculation in your commentary in the word processor. So you could think of the spreadsheet as being like an appendix to your main report which is contained in your word processor. So don't worry about any calculations getting lost or not being marked in the spreadsheet. That won't happen. It'll get marked in exactly the same way. It'll have just as much attention from the markers as your word processor will have. So calculations in the spreadsheet and then refer to those calculations um, in the main part of your report in the word processor. I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. Um, Thinking about the spreadsheet, the examiners are saying that a lot of students, and it's not all students, of course, but but students who struggle tend to make tend not to make best use of the spreadsheet functionality, um, and that could even be as extreme as just using the spreadsheet as a table, doing calculations in their calculator, and then typing up the answers in the cells within the spreadsheet, um, and that is just a real shame, a real shame, because remember the markers if they have to will interrogate cells within the spreadsheet. So if you've used a formula in the spreadsheet, even if you've set it out clearly, but the marker still not quite sure what you're trying to calculate, they will look at the formula within the cell to see if you've used the correct methodology to try and award you some partial marks. And by not using a spreadsheet functionality, by using a calculator instead, you're just losing any chance of getting at the partial marks and that and that would be a real um, real shame and um, the third point is a trickier one to address I think um, and the examiner believes that some students might have slightly slow typing speeds now it's important to note that this is not an IT exam you're not being assessed on how quickly you can type but we do require a certain level um, of IT proficiency. And this is to reflect the workplace. If you want to work in accountancy, finance, um, any related industry, it's pretty accepted that you're going to need to work um, on, on a computer and you will need uh, that base level of IT proficiency. Um, how do you improve it? Well, the practice platform we keep talking about is a great resource to practice your word processor and your spreadsheet skills. Um, and another free resource that we quite like is typing.com. Um, and that just provides training uh, on your typing skills. Um, and just finally, in big uh, letters down the bottom, these areas, whether it's ineffective use of the response areas, whether it's not making use of the spreadsheet functionality, if your, your, your IT skills aren't quite up to it, big impact on time management, not completing the exam, missing out on lots of available marks. Um, so as I say, just wanted to highlight these areas of things to look out for as you prepare um, for the September session. And um, just some illustrations of, of what I'm talking about here. Um, so this is just a screenshot of an answer that, that I prepared from an APM exam. Um, it was one of the exams um, last year. Um, and this particular answer is in response to a question that asked us to prepare a cost of quality report and comment on potential quality cost changes um, in light of a proposed move to a just-in-time approach. Um, it, the question doesn't matter, guys. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that we have done a calculation on the right-hand side of the screen. So I've used the spreadsheet response area. You can see in my red box, I have even titled it up, Appendix 1, Cost of Quality Report. doesn't matter what the calculation is. I've done it in the spreadsheet. I've given it a nice, clear total, and I've set it out um, nice and clearly. I, I, I hope you'd agree. On the left-hand side, I've got my word processor response area. And straight away, I'm just saying, look, the results of the report, the results of my calculation, whatever it happened to be, are shown in Appendix 1. And straight away, the marker knows that I've done my calculation in the spreadsheet response area. 
the marker's going to go away and give me lots of marks for a good calculation, hopefully. I don't need to replicate the calculation in the word processor. You know, and I'll talk in a moment about how I've used some of the spreadsheet functionality effectively as well. So really, really sort of, I suppose, general point here, but look, calculation in the spreadsheet, referencing that overall calculation in the first line of my word processor answer, setting the scene, the marker knows what to expect. Um, let's go into a little bit more detail. So this might be too small to see on the screen at the moment, but you can download the slides. You can spend your time exploring um, what I'm showing you in a bit more detail. Um, but all I'm trying to illustrate here is that during or uh, within my uh, word processor answer, within my commentary, I'm referring to numbers um, in my spreadsheet. I'm referring to numbers in my calculation. Um, so I talk about something being 3% of revenue, as you can see. Uh, in the red box. Um, and on the right hand side, I've got my calculation. I'm just showing you that I've taken that figure from my spreadsheet, from my calculation, and I'm just referring to it in uh, my commentary. Um, and as we move on to the next uh, paragraph as well, um, here I'm talking about um, something being 4% of revenue. Um, and again, just referencing in red on the right hand side, I've just taken another key figure um, from uh, the spreadsheet and I've included it in my commentary. Um, the, the calculation has shown that it's an important point uh, that I want uh, to uh, mention. Um, and hopefully you're getting the theme here, guys. You know, I, I, as I say, calculation in the spreadsheet, um, I'm writing up my, my main answer, the main part of the report. I'm treating my calculation like an appendix and I'm just pulling out the figures and referring to them. I'm not duplicating my effort. Um, and in terms of making use of the spreadsheet functionality, um, this was quite a simple one. Um, you know, depending on the exam, depending on the question, there's there's more advanced functionality that we're keen for you to get familiar with. But even at a very basic level, you can see that I've done a calculation which is a percentage of revenue. So various costs and a percentage of revenue. Um, and I've just used a simple formula, as you can see, and I've been able to drag that formula down. So it's giving me the percentages of revenue for all of those costs, really easy. Just putting in one formula um, and dragging it down. Um, and again, it's a little thing, but, but using the percentage um, auto formatting button you know, to save me you know, moving it to, to decimal places, to save me typing in the, the percentage symbol all the time, just little things that can buy me a bit of time. Um, and again, just pausing, I suppose, to, to reflect the simple layout. I've used some simple formatting. I didn't really need to. I didn't necessarily need to, to put my headings in bold. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I've, I've set it out clearly. The columns are nice and appropriately uh, spaced out. Um, you know, I've, I've referenced um, my, my columns. I've given them titles. I've put subtitles in. And um, hopefully you'd agree uh, that this is quite an easy calculation to follow. And this is the sort of thing uh, we're aiming uh, to do. OK. Um, Moving on from that, Lucy mentioned one of her favorite resources was the exam approach videos, and I'd certainly um, echo that. Um, and I just wanted to spend a few minutes um, giving you a flavor, giving you a taste of, of the sort of guidance that you can expect to get uh, from those videos. So we looked at APM in that previous example. Um, let's look at SBL. Um, just uh, just because we had to pick one, um, let's look at SBL uh, for uh, this next illustration. Um, so this is the intro screens, the instruction screens. Um, for context, I took these screen grabs, um, which you'll be able to see in the slide deck. I took these screen grabs from my ACCA work laptop. Um, it's got a 14-inch screen. It's fairly standard. There's nothing particularly fancy. I just want to illustrate that even on a you know, regular size laptop screen, we can still manage our workspace effectively. Okay, if we invest time practicing, um, spending a bit of time, we can still make the software appear in a user-friendly way uh, on our screen. Um, so as I say, these are the instruction screens, the introduction screens. We've got 10 minutes in the exam to review them if we want to. Hopefully, by the time we sit our live exam in September, we're really familiar uh, with um, everything that we're looking at. But there's some time there if we want it. And obviously, um, when we're ready to start, uh, we just confirm, yes, we're ready to go. Um, and then we're stuck we're getting stuck straight into it. Um, so using SBL as an example, what you'll see in the exam approach video series 
is the guidance to look at the background information on the desktop first of all. So we can expect to be told about our overall role um, or we can expect to be told that we may take on different roles in each of the tasks. So both of those options um, are potentially going to come up for SBL. Um, and what you'll see is this background information just sets the scene at a high level, but it sets the scene. And we need to understand the high level scenario before we start thinking about the tasks that we might be asked to address. Now for SBL, the guidance is very much to then have a good look at exhibit one. And in SBL, exhibit one is always going to give us a bit more of a detailed overview of the exam scenario. So note that we haven't looked at any of the requirements or tasks, as I should say, for SBL. Um, we're going straight to exhibit one just to increase our understanding of the overall scenario for the case study. Um, and you can see on screen, uh, I've used the highlight functionality. Um, it's something that I find useful to help me assimilate the information. Just use a few different colors to pull out a few bits. So who I am, who I work for, uh, and some key uh, points about the industry that the company uh, that uh, is involved in this particular case. Um, having done that, we would then move on to our proper planning. Um, and nothing's changed from our advice uh, to uh, that we gave for planning on paper in that we would still aim to spend between 40 to 60 minutes planning um, before we finish up our answer. So we've already spent two or three minutes looking at the background information, looking at exhibit one. Um, in addition to that, uh, we can spend 40 uh, up to 60 minutes in total um, on planning. Um, what I like to do and, and the guidance that you'll see in the exam approach video series is to take the tasks and copy them into the word processor one by one. Start breaking them down. Start thinking about the subheadings that you're going to use um, in your final report. Even start thinking about using models and theories to give you um, structure to help you break down those requirements, those tasks as much as possible. Um, and you can see in, in the example to A part one, uh, we're asked for an analysis of the industry, um, the environment. I'm thinking porters, I'm thinking pestle. Um, I know that there's two different um, there's two different uh, markets in which we're operating in. So I'm already thinking, okay, 15 marks uh, for part A, part one, split between two different markets. That's six to seven different marks. If I used, let's say, porters five forces, all I need is one point per heading. That already gets me five marks times two for the two different markets, well, I'm, I'm up at 10 out of 15, a strong pass, um, without even looking at any um, of the detail yet. So I can see what my structure is likely to be. And that continues for the integrated reporting, which is the next part of the question. I know there's six headings. I know that they're going to be uh, my subheadings in my answer. So worthwhile investing a bit of time um, analyzing those requirements. Um, next stage of planning is to methodically work our way through all of the exhibits in turn. And what I like to do is to take relevant content as I see it in the exhibit and paste it into the word processor response. Um, I pull out the relevant information and then I start to think about what it means. Now, of course, you're not going to get any credit whatsoever by just pasting content from exhibits into your word processor. Uh, answer. But what it does mean is that you've got relevant information that you can then make a comment on. You can then develop. And then, of course, you'd be looking to go back and delete that um, exhibit content. So just basically chopping up the relevant parts of exhibits and putting them into the correct place um, in your overall structure in the correct area for um, each requirement. Um, that's quite a... Uh, uh, I suppose an involved process, which is why we're saying up to 60 minutes potentially for planning. It does require a bit of discipline, but after you've done that, think about what you've done. You've pulled out all the relevant points from all the exhibits. They're in the correct place in terms of each um, task, each subtask. Um, so you're in a pretty strong position to then go back and add value and develop your points um, and provide that insight that the examiner is looking, uh, looking for. Um, so when you've gone through that process, you've invested time doing that, um, it's then just time to reflect on where you are from a timing perspective. Um, I would recommend using the notepad, uh, sorry, the scratch pad, excuse me, um, for this. So 
I know that I've got X number of um, requirements or tasks to finish up. I look at the time that I've got remaining and I just divvy up my time. I split up my time according to the marks available for each of those requirements. Probably the only time I'd use the scratch pad um, to record timings. Um, but again, the whole point of the practice platform is that you can experiment with this recommended exam approach to see what best suits you. Um, and then just as an illustration, again, just think about the screen management, uh, the workspace management, I suppose. You can see that I've got, and this is on my, my work laptop, guys. You can see I've got my word processor put nicely to the right-hand side. And hopefully you can imagine me opening up the exhibits in turn on the left-hand side. If I needed my spreadsheet open at the same time as my word processor, I'd pop that spreadsheet on the left-hand side, keep that word processor on the right-hand side. So once I resize it once, it'll stick to that size unless I change it. So once I've got my workspace set up um, how I want it, um, it's gonna be nice and efficient for me. Um, again, I won't dwell on it, but you can hopefully get a gist of how my answer is set out in terms of headings, lots of spacing, um, you know, simple formatting, un, you know, underlining, bolding, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but like I said, I won't dwell on it. Um, you guys can take this away in the slides um, and have a detailed look if it's of interest. Okay, Lucy, that's everything that I was hoping to, to, to cover. Hopefully some good pointers um, and a flavor, as I say, about what students can expect in the more detailed guidance, whether it's the video series, the subject specific webinars, um, et cetera. I think we've just got a few minutes left for any uh, questions that have come through. Yeah, so we've got five or six minutes left. Um, you and I have both been answering questions when the other of us has been talking. So hopefully we've... Um sent quite a few answers through. There were a few kind of commonly asked questions coming through that I thought it would be good to tackle. Um, so, so firstly, where you were demonstrating how you can copy the requirements into the response option and, and that then, you know, it frees up some space on your screen because you can close the requirements windows. We had a few questions coming through about that, asking um, whether, the, whether they should leave the requirements they've copied across in the answer before they submit. And um, what I've been saying generally in response to that is, if you've got time to, it would probably be good practice to remove those requirements from your completed answer. But equally, if you don't have time, you won't be penalized for them being in there. Would you yeah, agree with that? Would you have anything to add? No, spot on, I completely, I completely agree. In an ideal world, if you had time, it'd be great to go back to the, that requirement wording and tidy it up and, and make it more of a heading as opposed to just the requirement. But it's not essential. You, the, the, the marker won't think badly of you if you hadn't had time to do that. And I think let's just reiterate the distinction between having requirement wording in your answer as a sort of heading, as a sort of you know section break, compared to having content that you've directly pasted from an exhibit. So what we, we don't want to see content from an exhibit, so you will need to, to go back and delete that once you've used it for part of your planning. But I completely agree, Lucy, if, if there's still wording from a requirement that you've pasted in, that's not a big issue at all. Okay, perfect. Um, another question that we've had through in a variety of different forms is about um, using the spreadsheet for calculations and if you have, if you're answering a predominantly written question and say as part of that, you need to do a fairly minor, small calculation, quite a few people asking, could could they just do that within the word processor? Yeah, well, I suppose it comes down to whatever is quickest. Now, I maintain that for a calculation of any real length or any complexity at all, definitely the spreadsheet. But if there's something that is a very simple table um, and it's quicker to keep it in a in a word processor than than fine. I'm not going to you know obviously insist that the spreadsheet must be used. Um, I've got no problem with it being in the word processor, but only if it's very simple. Um, mm. You know, if there's any risk at all in terms of spending too long on it, or it being quicker perhaps to use the formula in the spreadsheet, I'd always default to the spreadsheet. But again, if you can pull it off and it's very simple. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no, you know, no, no, no drawback um, as long as they get it right, as long as students get it right in the uh, in the word processor. But I must admit, notwithstanding that, my instinct is always to think spreadsheet for calculation. I must yeah. admit. Yeah. 
I do wonder well, sometimes whether students are put off by that because they then feel they, you know, they realise they've got to link everything together. But I think it's one of those things that when you're actually in the, when you've practised doing it and you're in the habit of doing that, it isn't as big a deal as you might think it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think um, I, the point I was trying to make earlier is that, you know, stuff that you've put in a spreadsheet doesn't get lost. You know, it, it doesn't, it, it gets marked, it, it gets just as much, if not more, attention from the markers as well. So don't worry that if you put some fantastic stuff in the spreadsheet that's not, you know, everything's not in your word processor, that's fine. But, you know, let's, let's not worry about that. That great content in the spreadsheet will, will still get um, the marks it deserves. Okay. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of questions now and just and answer them straight off. These are ones that we get asked a lot. So firstly, um, people asking whether the practice platform automatically saves work. Yes, it does, as do the real exams. So we get asked that a lot as well. You don't have to do anything to save what, what's, what you're doing um, in either the practice platform or the real exam. And also, if you close what your response area, if you've got your word processor open, for example, you're typing in that and you close it either intentionally or accidentally, that when you open it again, what you've been working on will still be there. So, so that work is retained. Um, another question for you, James, again, which we, we, I think we get quite a lot, uh, students asking whether it is recommended to show your workings next to what you're doing, say in the spreadsheet. Yeah, good, good question. Um, I suppose you don't need to type out every single formula that you use, but you want to label your calculations so that it's obvious of, of what you're doing. So, for example, something that springs to mind is, I don't know, a simple MPV calculation um, as, as an illustration. I wouldn't type out every single formula that I've used. I'd, I'd use the formula within a cell but what i would do is just have clearly labeled columns for each of my years uh, i'd clearly state my discount factor so the marker can see effectively what i've done just by the way that i've labeled uh, my calculation as opposed to typing out every single formula um, separately that, that i've used within a cell so it's all about making the calculation clear and easy to follow don't worry about replicating every single formula that you use outside of that cell Okay, perfect. We're nearly out of time. I'm just having a look. There are lots and lots of questions coming through. Um, and I wonder if we could just maybe end by talking a little bit about the scratch pad and how that could be used. Getting a few questions yeah. on that. Okay, so my approach, um, I'll be honest, I wouldn't use the, the, the scratch pad much. Um, I tend to use it whenever I'm working an exam. Um, I tend to use it to just manage my time. Um, so I'll, I'll divvy up my time or split out my time based on um, what's left after my planning um, and the marks available for each part of, of the exam. Um, and that's because I do my planning in the word processor. Um, mm. There's nothing wrong with using the scratch pad as almost like a draft word processor. So copying the the um, requirements and then maybe copying content from the exhibits into the, the scratch pad, then working it through and then copying, you know, typing up your answers in the word processor. That's fine. Um, but for me, it just adds an extra level of complexity. Um, I'm worried that I'd leave stuff in the scratch pad that doesn't get marked. So scratch pad is not a response area. It's for workings. It doesn't get marked. So play around with it. Do whatever suits you best. That's what the practice platform is there for. As I say, I personally don't use a scratch pad for much, but other people might have slightly different ways of working. Practice and see what suits you best, guys. Excellent. Thank you, James. Um, and we are more or less out of time now. Um, as ever, it's gone in the blink of an eye. It feels like it was a bit of a whistle-stop tour of, of all our support, but I really hope that you've um, all got some benefit from the session. Remember, it is available, once this ends, it will be available on demand using the link that you already have. So please do go back in and, you know, re-watch any bits that you want to watch. Make sure that you open the resources section and have a look at the resources that are in there. Please download that one pager so that you can um, click on the, you know, the interactive links for, for whichever exam or exams you're preparing for. Um, and I think all that's left is to wish you all the very best of luck with your exams. And thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone.